so um, uh, uh, please, um, if anyone has any questions, just jump in and, and interrupt me. Um, so I was a little bit at loose ends to um, uh, two minds about what to, to talk about today. And I thought I'd talk about something that's been bugging me for several years uh, in the hope that maybe somebody in the audience might be able to shed some light on it. So just to, um, uh, by way of introduction, um, my, my lab um, studies um, information processing, mostly in um, in, um, in mammalian cells, um, and um, we focus on particular mechanisms of information processing, uh, such as post-translational modification and, and gene regulation. Uh, and more recently, we've developed an interest in, um, in the question of learning in cells. And um, uh, that's rather new, and I won't really talk about it, but that's a sort of snapshot of what's going on in the lab. And uh, together with these sort of areas of biological focus, um, we've um, devoted a lot of time and attention to trying to develop some of the mathematical and, and biophysical foundations for studying um, those kinds of mechanisms and, and processes in biology. And this started off very much in the context of reaction networks, as some of you will recall. But um, we've been drawn towards um, a particular, I would say, sort of subset of that, um, which uh, we refer to as the linear framework. It's a way of decomposing reaction networks into directed graphs with labeled edges. Um, that is really going to be the machine behind a lot of what I talk about today. But as we have a limited amount of time, and this is all published material, I'm not going to get into that side of things unless um, uh, there are questions that we can unwrap that. But I would just point to a couple of review papers, um, in particular one that's going to come out in Interface Focus um, shortly. We're just doing the proofs for it, um, which um, uh, sort of talks about a lot of the um, sort of machinery under the hood that I'm not explicitly going to have time to say very much about in the rest of the talk. So that's just by way of background. So as Mercedes mentioned, the, um, the uh, thing I wanted to focus on is this um, question of parameter geography. We call it geography. Geometry would be a perfectly reasonable alternative um, description. Um, geography has a sort of softer, fuzzier uh, meaning. And I think um, given how little we know about parametric regions, that seems appropriate. Um, but, but broadly speaking, uh, I think this refers to the question of what do regions of parameter space look like in which a particular kind of dynamical behavior is exhibited? Um, and there has been work on this by a number of people, and, and forgive me if I don't sort of review the history, I don't think that's appropriate here. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is a case study that we made, which I think throws up a number of sort of very interesting issues, still some of them very unresolved. Um, and this is a paper that came out in PLOS Computational Biology a couple of years ago. Um, and um, it was a very nice collaboration with uh, Dan Bates and uh, his PhD student, Silviana Amethyst. Um, and, um, uh, and that reflects the sort of two part uh, aspects of uh, how we approach this, which I'll, I'll, I'll say more about. But in brief, what we, um, the, the case study we did is of a, of a post-translational modification system with two sites. And we simplified this to assume that um, the, um, the uh, forward enzyme is operating in an ordered fashion and the reverse enzyme in the oppositely ordered fashion, so that there are actually only sort of three states of modification rather than four. It's just to reduce the complexity of the overall system. Um, so there's a single substrate S in three states of modification, uh, zero modifications, one modification, two, and a forward enzyme and a reverse enzyme. By the way, can people see my cursor here? Yeah, okay. Um, and the, it's well known, I would say to everyone here, that um, a system like this is capable of exhibiting um, bistability. And, and you'll forgive me if I use the word bistability here, um, in, in place of what we should have said, which is bistationarity, 
um, we're not really investigating the dynamical stability of the steady states, but for reasons of convention and, and, and use, uh, we, we continue to say the word bistable, um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll live with that for the rest of this talk. So there are quotation marks around bistability here, but there is a parameter space of high dimensionality, and uh, we're going to demarcate some box. It's a sort of logarithmic box in this parameter space. Um, and uh, look at those points within the box that exhibit uh, those parametric points that exhibit by stability. OK, so that's the broad problem. And, and we want to understand something about the, 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 the size and the shape. And we did a number of studies of, of sort of shape related things. But um, we'll concentrate here more on, on size issues. OK, so, so I have to tell you a little bit about these enzymes. And um, I don't want to get um, too bogged down here in um, issues that uh, have been sort of played out in the literature previously. But um, let me just say that you'll be familiar with the conventional example um, uh, assumption that people tend to use when studying sort of enzyme catalyzed systems, which is to assume that the enzyme follows a Michaelis Menten reaction mechanism. Um, and um, I, I think I've described this in the past as a form of original biochemical sin. And the sin here is the assumption that the product S1 cannot rebind to the enzyme. That may have been reasonable under the in vitro circumstances that Michaelis and Menten were using, were, were doing their original work. But in the context of, say, a personalization modification system, it really isn't reasonable. And we'll see some of the consequences of assuming that subsequently. So a more plausible assumption, uh, because it's often the case that modifications, if you think of phosphorylation, for instance, are often nearly irreversible under physiological conditions. So it, it is plausible to impose some form of irreversibility. It's just not plausible to assume that the product doesn't rebind. Um, so something like the, the mechanism in the middle might be a more plausible way to do that. Um, and what the linear framework allows is actually to use any mechanism that's based on this kind of grammar that allows the substrate to bind to the enzyme, form an intermediate complex, the intermediate complexes to, to move among themselves and then to form product. Um, and the machinery of the framework allows us to distill this mechanism at steady state into basically four aggregated parameters. And because this is in principle reversible. There are two parameters for the forward direction of the, um, of the enzyme. So it's converting sort of S0 to S1. Um, and for the reverse direction, where it's converting the ostensible product, S1, back into the ostensible substrate, S0. Um, and these, um, sorry. Um, um, and these parameters, uh, they have names which are not terribly important for us. There's a sort of michaelis menten like constant and a catalytic efficiency-like constant. Um, and, and there are four constants, two for the forward direction, two for the reverse direction. Um, and the mechanism can be arbitrarily complicated subject to a very um, simple condition uh, on the system that I won't go into. Okay. So, so we have this two site modification system. There are two enzymes. And uh, the enzyme is acting on um, uh, on, on two substrates, and each of those actions can take any of these mechanisms. So there are, in principle, four different mechanisms available, and we're assuming that they're weakly irreversible. Okay. Now, um, so, so this, is, this is, in principle, describing a, an unbounded number of different systems. But because of this, um, this uh, um, steady state assumptions, we can reduce the enzymes to these four aggregated parameters. Okay. Now, we take advantage here of an old result um, that goes back um, some years now, which is that um, this kind of multi-site post-translation modification system, um, there's a sort of model reduction, uh, which says that there's all sorts of moving parts here, but at steady state, um, really, the steady state is, is determined up to rational algebraic terms uh, by the conservation laws for the enzymes. And there are just two enzymes here. 
So despite all the apparently complicated dynamics that comes from the enzyme intermediate complexes and everything else, there are, this can be reduced to two steady state equations in two dynamical variables. And the dynamical variables are the concentrations of the free enzymes, which here we are de-dimensionalizing by in, in the way that you can see that. Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the details, but, but this is what the rational parameterization theorem allows us to do is to reduce um, this unbounded collection of different systems down to this system of two polynomial steady state, uh, two polynomial equations in two variables. Now, there's also a reduction in the parameters. Again, there could be a lot of parameters flying out there if the enzymes get very complicated. But again, we have this way of reducing them. There are eight non-dimensionalized non aggregated parameters under the weak irreversibility assumptions for the enzymes. Um, and there are basically six of them which have to do with these sort of michaelis menten like constants, and then two of them which reflect the ratios of the catalytic efficiencies of the uh, forward and reverse enzymes. And if you impose strong irreversibility, you'd think that you would end up with, with, um, with four of the um, uh, constants going to zero, but in fact you don't for reasons I won't get into, but it's just two that uh, go to zero, the, 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 the thing in the middle sort of causes a little bit of a, a, um, an issue there. So although the strong irreversibility is, is, is present, it doesn't, it doesn't turn itself into a, one of the aggregated parameters going to zero. Um, <clears throat> so there are six parameters under conditions of strong irreversibility. And then there are conserved quantities. And here they're non-dimensionalized again. And, and now we're imposing some limitations here. We're assuming that the um, enzyme totals are uh, the same. Uh, e total is equal to F total. And that all we're doing is changing the ratio of substrate total to the forward enzyme total. That's sigma, okay? So again, that's just a simplification. Okay, so that's one part of the story. It's, uh, it's the um, using the linear framework to do this model reduction and get this rational algebraic um, uh, set up. The other part of it is the bit that Dan Bates uh, brings to the story, which is all this wonderful um, method of homotopic continuation to do numerical polynomial solving. Um, and I, I think many of you will be familiar with this. It's a wonderful sort of resource to have to solve large polynomial systems. Again, I'm not going to get into the details of this, except to say that it's, it's quite an elaborate suite of software. There's Bettini, which actually does the sort of homotopic continuation um, method. There's Parametopy, which does this in a parametized way, which is important because we're doing parametrized families of polynomials. And then quite importantly, there is some um, alpha certified, which is a way of checking that there is really, uh, that there is a real solution that's close to your numerical solution. And because we get into some quite interesting and very delicate bits of numerical analysis here, we felt it was really quite important to sort of do this additional check to make sure that we weren't sort of seeing an artifact. Um, and while it wasn't impossible to do this on everything, we, we were very careful in doing sort of random sampling of what we found to run alpha certified on it. So the details are all in the paper, um, but, um, but, but we did our best to, I, I think we did as much as we could to ensure that we were not being deluded by numerical artifacts. Okay. All right, so, um, so what did we find? Um, well, the first thing, well, one of the things we looked at was the volume of the bistable region, okay? And just to remind you again, uh, we're in uh, an eight-dimensional, if we're weakly irreversible, an eight-dimensional parameter space. We're in a logarithmic box. Um, we chose different size boxes, but this one that we're looking at is from 10 to the minus 1 to 10. Um, we're looking at the region of multi-stability or bistability within that region. Um, H is the, the hypercube that uh, we're looking in. Um, and we're looking at the ratio of the volume of the bistable region 
to the volume of the hypercube. Okay, and we're estimating that. So, so one of the interesting things about this study is that it's a combination of doing, you know, kind of the mathematics, um, and the numerical analysis, and then basically what you have is an enormous point cloud in parameter space. And we're basically using methods that people typically use in the context of sort of high dimensional data analysis to, to estimate sort of properties of these point clouds like volume, shape, convexity, things like that. Um, so uh, uh, it, it's an interesting amalgam of those kinds of uh, ideas that come more from the experimental side and rather than from, from the mathematical side and putting them together. And I think that's actually quite interesting that you can do that and actually do a sort of experimental analysis on the mathematics and, and generate sort of interesting conjectures as a result, okay? Um, so we're estimating volumes by doing the obvious thing. You do a, a sampling of parameter space and count the number of points that lie in the, in the bistable region. Okay, okay so, so what you get if you um, uh, measure this, um, this estimate for the, um, for the, uh, the statistical estimate for this uh, volume ratio, uh, for which, by the way, there's very good um, uh, underlying statistics, so we can do an estimate of the error as well. Uh, and you can see the error bars here. And, and you see how this changes with sigma, which I remind you is the ratio of S total, the substrate total to the enzyme total. What you see is this um, sort of sigmoidal curve. Um, and there are several interesting things about this. One is it seems to increase monotonically. Uh, and note the word apparent. Um, that, that's really the puzzle that I want to talk about uh, in a moment hold on to that, but it looks pretty monotonic here. Um, the other thing is uh, that um, you'll notice that there's a sort of threshold. Below a certain amount of substrate, there is only uh, a monostable region. There's no bistability. Now we think that's actually a generic phenomenon that's true in much greater generality. And we have a paper coming out hopefully soon that, that sort of explains that. So I'm not gonna say very much more about this threshold. Um, what's interesting is the saturating um, uh, volume, which under weak irreversibility is actually a very small amount of the eight-dimensional hypercube. It's a uh, little over 1% as best we can estimate. What's interesting is that if you drop weak irreversibility and assume strong irreversibility, like Michaelis Menten, then what you see is you get much the same phenomenon, a threshold, apparent monotonicity, but now the proportion of the hypercube, the six-dimensional hypercube, becomes much larger. It's 23%. That's huge. Okay, so if you stick to strongly irreversible mechanisms, you can be deluded into thinking that the phenomenon of bistability is actually quite robust, in terms of the size of the parametric space, when in fact, under more plausible assumptions, it's actually not really so robust. It's actually kind of mm, a little unlikely in parametric terms. So I think, I think this is another good demonstration of how this assumption of strong irreversibility is really singular. And I think it has been, in my view, quite misleading in terms of some of the conclusions that we've been drawn from it. All right, so, um, so, so, so how does this change occur between the strong irreversibility and the weak irreversibility? We think there's actually an interesting conjecture tucked away here. Um, and what we see um, is that it seems to be related to the amount of product rebinding. Um, the aggregated parameters phi zero and epsilon two jointly uh, measure the amount of product rebinding. And it seems to be the case that if their product, uh, meaning multiply them together, not product rebinding, if you multiply them together, then that has not got, that's got not, that has to be small enough for there to be bistability. If it gets too large, bistability basically ceases. So I think there's a very interesting conjecture here. Um, about the, uh, the origins of, um, of multi-stability in weakly irreversible systems. So I'll just sort of throw that out there. We don't have a good reason, uh, good understanding of why this happens, um, but 
I, 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 you know, I'm always hopeful that someone else will will follow up on it and 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 figure out what's going on here. Okay, but the thing I really want to talk about, and given that I have just a few minutes left to talk about it, um, is um, this apparent monotonicity. You see, because what we showed from the plot on the uh, the uh, oops on this slide is is this monotonic increase of the volume ratio with sigma. And what we see is that, um, in other words, that if sigma one is less than sigma two, it apparently the volume of the bistable region is less than the volume of the multistable. So the simplest way to explain that is if um, these regions are just increasing in size, right? That would immediately imply a monotonic increase in the volume. And to our amazement, I mean, this was just not what we were expecting. This is absolutely not true. The volume, the, the region does not increase as sigma increases. Um, and here's a demonstration of that fact. Um, so we're watching um, uh, uh, four parametric uh, uh, settings um, over a range of sigma values. And um, remember that, you know, the model reduction gives us two polynomial equations in two unknowns. So what we have here is a kind of pseudo nullcline plot. We just plot the curves for these uh, solutions of these polynomial equations where they cross are the steady states or they're, they're really the, the amounts of the free enzymes, but you can rationally recover all the other steady state uh, dynamical variables and steady state from that. Okay, so it's a kind of nullcline, pseudo nullcline plot. So um, if you take um, this parametric setting, here is a steady state that as sigma changes, it remains a single steady state. It's, a, it's in the, this parameter set um, remains in the monostable region as sigma increases. Uh, in contrast, here's a, a, a parameter set where um, as you change sigma, uh, you have a monostable, um, uh, the no bistability, uh, uh, but then you acquire bistability and you return, you remain in the bistable region. The really interesting thing happens in um, in the third and fourth rows, because here what you see is for this uh, um, in, in the setting is that you have um, monostability followed by bistability, followed by monostability as sigma increases. So this parametric point is in the monostable region, it moves into the bistable region and then it pops out into the monostable region. And we call this phenomenon blinking. And here's an even more elaborate example, which starts monostable, bistable, monostable, bistable. It goes in and out. So this region is not growing, it's kind of ruffling. And if you look to see where the parameter points are that are doing this ruffling, they're on the boundary of the region. So the boundary of this region is, is, is kind of, you know, exhibiting this kind of blinking. And the weirdness here is that although it's not growing, it's got this kind of blinking thing, if you step back from it and look at it at the scale that we were plotting those curves, it's still monotonic. So the scale of these fluctuations is small enough that it doesn't actually jeopardize the monotonicity in the large. So I have no idea what's going on here. And all I can say is that this is not what I expect polynomial systems to do. There's something going on here. I don't understand. Maybe somebody else has an understanding of it. I'd love to, to know. Um, but this has been bugging me ever since we did this, because it seems to me that it's suggesting that somehow these apparently relatively straightforward high dimensional polynomial systems have some kind of intricacy in them, which is unexpected. Um, and that's really what I wanted to say. So um, I'm sorry for exceeding my time budget by a couple of minutes, but I just want to say that this was a real pleasure working with Dan and Silviana over the course of several years on this project, which started when Chris Nam was a, um, a, a summer student in the lab. 
Um, and I mentioned this result about the threshold, which is independent work with Jeremy Iron that I haven't really talked about. Um, this is my lab, some of the people that we collaborate with, and some of the students who've contributed to the linear framework over the years. So thank you very much for your patience.